an Easter egg for an Anzac. A World War I story from Limnos. In the village of Portiano, on the Greek island of Limnos, there lived a little girl called Irini. Her home was at the foot of a hill that overlooked the Bay of Mudros, which is the largest harbour on Limnos. Irini was collecting eggs, as she did every morning. She was tucking her hand under the soft bellies of the roosting chickens and filling her basket with the warm white eggs. A full basket today, her mother would be pleased. Eggs are better than money, her mother would say. Irini's family didn't have any money, but you could buy anything you wanted with eggs. She would take some to Barba Yorgo in exchange for a few cuts of lamb, and some more to Barbayanis for some sesame oil, and then a few left for the family. After all, there were nine mouths to feed. Thankfully, there were always eggs to spare. Firewood, water, olive oil were scarce, but eggs were everywhere. As she was counting them, Irini heard a cry from the village square. Erjon de Taplia! Elate! The ships are coming! Come and see! Irini ran to the top of the hill and saw the most incredible sight. Hundreds of enormous ships, like giant monsters belching out great puffs of black smoke and groaning their way into Mudros harbour. These were foreign ships coming from across the seas, carrying soldiers from lands far, far away. Irini had heard that the people travelling inside the belly of these ships had been journeying for weeks. They had come from an island that was much bigger than Limnos, called Australia. Irini had been told that there was a war in Turkey and that these ships were floating hospitals carrying doctors and nurses and medicines and soldiers who were fighting in the war. Limnos would be offering them hospitality for a while. Irini had never seen a hospital before. They were very noisy and a little frightening. But they fascinated her. And so, every morning, after egg collection and milking, Irini would climb the hill to look out over the bay and at the ships that were moored there. Over the course of the next few days, she noticed some strange changes. Hundreds, thousands of little white triangles were appearing in clusters across the harbour. And even as she watched, she could see more and more popping up all the way along the port like little teeth lining the mouth of the bay. What on earth were they? Irini's curiosity got the better of her. She took her egg basket, grabbed her little brother and persuaded him to go with her to the sea to see the triangles. They took the donkey and set off. The wind picked up as they approached the sea. Irini had to hold onto her scarf, which was flapping furiously around her face. They reached a row of barbed wire, and beyond it there were mattresses on the ground, and boxes and chairs, wagons and jars. Young soldiers dressed in very fancy uniforms, wide-brimmed hats and strong black boots were walking in and out of the white triangles, which now looked huge, like enormous white sheets flapping in the wind. They kept falling down and the soldiers were running around, trying to fasten them to the ground and put them back up again. Irini shivered in the wind. Let's go, her brother said. We might get into trouble. But one of the soldiers had seen them, and he was now coming towards them. Irini was seized with fear. She reached for the donkey, but the man had already caught up. He took off his hat and smiled widely, displaying the whitest set of teeth that Irini had ever seen in her life. The soldier was pointing at the basket of eggs. Irini stared at him and then held out the basket. The man chose a few eggs and put them in his hat. He then put the hat on the ground and took a gold coin out of his pocket. He tossed it in the air and caught it. He opened up his clenched fist, but the coin wasn't there. Then the soldier reached behind Irini's ear and produced two gold coins. Irini giggled and the soldier gave one to her and one to her brother. Irini had never seen gold before. It felt heavy and precious in her hand, as heavy as an egg. 
The soldier then pointed to himself. Jack, he said. Irini smiled shyly. His voice was clear and pleasant. She slowly pointed to herself and said, Irini. Jack repeated her name. It sounded strange when he said it and she giggled again. Then she remembered her brother who was watching all of this cautiously. Tassos, she said, pulling her brother closer. Jack smiled. He picked up his hat and returned to the tents where everyone gathered around the eggs enthusiastically. They must be hungry, Irini thought. She couldn't wait to get back to the village and tell her mother about their adventure. When she got home, she waved the gold coin in her mother's face. Look, Mama, look! Is this more precious than an egg? Her mother stared at it in disbelief and promptly took both coins and put them in her pocket. From that day on, Irini's egg rounds changed dramatically. Once a week, with Mama's approval, Irini would take the donkey and her brother as an escort and they would clippity-clop, clippity-clop all the way down to the harbour. It always got colder as she approached the sea despite the late March sunshine, so Mama would make sure she wore her woolen shawl around her face. Irini looked forward to seeing Jack waving at her as they approached. She would call out, Kalimera, Sasefera Avga, good morning, I've brought you eggs and he would take off his hat and smile and pull faces, saying all sorts of funny-sounding things which made her laugh. Irini wondered how the soldiers could stand being in the wind every day when she could hardly stand it for a few hours. And so the weeks passed. Now Easter was approaching, and the village preparations for the most important feast day of the year were in full swing. The smell of Easter bread and biscuits filled the streets, everyone was dyeing their eggs red, and Irini was busy at home boiling onion skins to make the dye, dipping the eggs into the muddy red water and then rubbing the painted shells with olive oil to make them shine, as was the tradition. On Easter day, the bells rang out and Irini proudly took her basket of glossy red eggs to the church. The whole village piled in for the service. The priest stood before the congregation, took a red egg from it in his basket, held it up high and exclaimed, Christos Anesti! Christ is risen! Alithos Anesti! the people cried back. He is risen indeed! This is the day of resurrection, the priest continued, and these red eggs are a symbol of new life and freedom from death. But we have soldiers here on our island, from foreign lands, who have left their home and families to fight in a war that will bring them face to face with death so that we can have freedom. So today, let us take our eggs and Easter breads and let us go to the soldiers and share the joy and hope of Easter with them and wish them Christos Anesti. Well, Irini was inspired after the priest had distributed the eggs, she took her egg home and she began to decorate it. She wanted to make this one extra special. She then prepared a basket of treats with sweet breads, more red eggs, pastries and even some wine which she found in the cellar. Finally, she placed the specially decorated red Easter egg in the basket. That one was for Jack. She tied the basket to the donkey and went into the square, but there was no one there. They had already set off, so she ran to catch up, but in her haste she tripped and fell on the rocky downhill path. She tried to pull herself up, but when she put weight on her foot it gave way immediately. Irini winced with pain. Voithya, help! she started shouting. But who would hear her now? The wind carried her voice away. And meanwhile, her donkey continued its route towards the harbour without her, completely deaf to her cries. All she could do was wait. After what felt like hours, she saw her donkey returning, and holding him was Jack. She started to cry with relief as he approached. He checked her ankle and then picked her up, put her on the donkey and guided it back towards the sea. 
They passed the barbed wire fence and went into the campsite and then into one of the white triangle tents which had a red cross on the outside. To her amazement, Irini saw many beds laid out inside. She wondered who was going to lie in all those beds. The sheets were so white and everything so neat and tidy. Jack placed her on a bed. She had never been on a real bed before, only a hard mattress on the floor. A doctor came in and her leg was examined. Irini became aware of her bare feet. They were calloused and dirty. Everyone here wore boots and shoes. She tried to hide her legs under her skirt, but the doctor carefully bound them up in the softest white cloth. And Jack was there too, smiling and making jokes. She pointed to the basket and Jack went out to the donkey, untied the basket and brought it over to her. Irini began to distribute the delicious food. And last of all, she brought out the special red Easter egg the one she had decorated, and she gave it to Jack. He took it very carefully in his hands and examined it, and then he put it in his hat. He was going to keep this one. Then Jack carried Irini back out to the donkey, and she joined the rest of the villagers who were returning home. After her accident, poor Irini was confined to the village, Mama insisted that her leg needed to heal. Irini was so upset. What if Jack was waiting for her? What if he didn't get any eggs now? And when would she see him again? There was news that the soldiers would be leaving soon to fight in Gallipoli in Turkey. A few days later there was a commotion in the village. The Australians are coming, the villagers were shouting. Sure enough, some soldiers were coming into the village of Portiano on donkeys. The locals came out of their homes offering fruit and biscuits and staring at the soldiers with curiosity. They certainly didn't look like the village men. They were a lot taller. Their jackets had brass buttons and not one of them was wearing sheep fur. Irini's mother came running into the house shouting, Irini, Irini, look! Irini came to the door and there was Jack coming towards her. He had a friend with him, and they were both smiling. He was holding a pair of boots in his arms. He made Irini sit down to try them on. They were a little big for her, but Irini was delighted. She had never had shoes before, just a pair of clogs, but they belonged to her sister, and she was only allowed to wear them on Sundays. Now she would be the only girl in the village with leather boots. Jack pointed to his friend, who was holding a small machine, Everyone smiled. The machine clicked and the moment was captured forever. When Irini woke up the next morning, she felt a strange atmosphere in the air. She hobbled out of the house and slowly crawled up the hill on all fours. When she looked out at the harbour, she saw that the giant monster ships were moving out of the port. The soldiers were going to war. The next few weeks were difficult for everyone on the island. People could hear the sound of explosions from across the sea, and every day Irini prayed for Jack to be safe. Some months later, she saw some new boats coming into the harbour. Maybe it was Jack coming back. Without telling anyone where she was going, Irini secretly untied the donkey and took the rocky path leading down to the campsite. And then as she approached, she saw a sight that she would never forget. Soldiers were being offloaded from some of the boats. They were lying on stretchers, and young women were carrying them into the tents. So that was why the beds had been prepared. The women were dressed completely in white, and they were working hard, applying bandages, distributing water. The soldiers were crying out in pain. Irini couldn't bear to look. On some of the stretchers, you couldn't see the men's faces. They were wrapped from head to toe in a flag. Irini started shouting the only word she knew might help her find her soldier. Jack! Jack! But no one was listening to her. And then an officer saw her and waved to her to go back. 
she sadly made her way back to the village. The next day, Irini went to church and lit a candle for Jack. As she came out, she saw a procession walking past. There were horses and nurses and soldiers solemnly carrying several coffins. They were making their way towards the open cemetery further down the path. Irini began to panic. She had to know if Jack was among the ones being buried. But who could she ask? And then she recognised one of the soldiers. The one who had been with Jack the day he gave her the boots. He looked solemn and preoccupied. She plucked up all her courage and ran over to him. He recognised her. Jack, she said. The man stopped. He shook his head. He put his hand on it in his shoulder, and then he pointed to the coffin directly in front of them. Jack, he said. Irini felt her knees weaken. She looked down at her shoes, at the shoes that Jack had given her, and now he was gone. She watched as they laid Jack's coffin into the grave and put a cross on it and fired the final salute. Irini would often sit by Jack's grave, and as the weeks passed, she watched as more and more crosses filled the graveyard. When the war finally ended, many families came from Australia to Limnos to visit the grave of their son or their husband or their father. They came carrying earth from Australia to place on the graves and inscriptions for the tombstones. Irini waited and waited, eager to meet a member of Jack's family. Maybe he had a brother or a sister. She longed to tell them about the good man who had shown so much kindness to a poor village girl and had touched her life forever. But no one ever came. So Irini decided that she would care for Jack's grave and look after it. And every Easter, Jack's grave was the only grave with a beautifully decorated red Easter egg by the tombstone.